Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is a special Middle East edition of City Talk. Quagmire and civil war in Iraq, Hamas versus Fatah in Palestine, Shiites versus Sunnis, Israel and Saudi Arabia, strange bedfellows, rice in the Middle East, Senator Warner and former Secretary of State Baker say staying the course is not the way, Iran with the A-bomb, Joining me again to talk about the Middle East is a distinguished Middle East hand, Richard Murphy, former U.S. ambassador to Mauritania, Syria, the Philippines, and Saudi Arabia. He is the former Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs and Asian Affairs during the Reagan years. And Ambassador Murphy is a widely consulted expert and frequent TV commentator on things Middle East, Welcome back, Ambassador Murphy. It's always a pleasure. My pleasure, I did. Let's start with Secretary of State Rice. She was in the Middle East uh, last week, in fact, and the Washington Post headline, Rice's tour of Middle East yields little progress on key issues. What's she doing? What are U.S. goals? What's going on? Well, her staff was uh, telling us before the trip uh, don't have high expectations. Now that's kind of a standard overture to a Secretary of State's uh, visit so that uh, if there are achievements, they say, wow. Right. Uh, no wows here? I don't see any wows. Uh, if you remember last November, she went out there and negotiated an agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians that uh, the two main crossing points into Gaza Carney and Rafa would be open for commerce. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> uh, just hasn't happened. They opened, they shut them. And they shut them for a prolonged period as violence grew uh, after Hamas was elected uh, to be the governing party, the majority uh, uh, winner in the elections last January. So, in a sense, she was going back to redo what uh, we all hoped would stay done. And in fact, what she got done was that the Israelis agreed to the concept of open border. So for over a year, we've literally made no progress there. No progress on that. Uh, and the situation of the, particularly the people in Gaza, but it's, it's also tough on the West Bank. But in Gaza, it's, it's become a real prison. They can't get the products out. They, uh, they can't, uh, their banks are not functioning because foreign assistance and foreign investment in Gaza, which was, was limited, the investment was limited, but nothing is possible now because of the uh, way we in particular have said, uh, if you elect a terrorist to be your government, uh, we're not obliged to give it a hand. Okay, let's let's go immediately then into Palestine. The last time we talked was exactly a year ago. Israeli settlers had left Gaza. Sharon was the prime minister. Uh, the Palestinian National Assembly elections were coming up in January 2006. The popularity of Hamas was an open question, but this roadmap, this roadmap that would lead from Baghdad, through Baghdad to Jerusalem, hasn't happened. Let's start with the Hamas victory in January 2006. What, did, what does that mean? What was our reaction? Was it the right reaction? Well, let's start a little bit before the election itself, because now critics of, the, uh, uh, of Washington uh, in Israel, in the United States, are saying, you know, the mistake was made in allowing Hamas to compete in the elections without having agreed to the basic rules that you would accept what predecessor Palestinian governments had, had negotiated. You'd stop violence and you would uh, accept Israel's uh, right to exist. Mm -hmm. 
And when, they, when that wasn't insisted on, uh, we were surprised. In fact, some say Hamas itself was surprised that in the elections, they came out not with the uh, expected uh, minority achievement of 40%, which would have been a remarkable mm -hmm. surge in support, but with an absolute majority in the elections and the right to form the government. But isn't this what this whole war in Iraq and U.S. policy in the Middle East was, democratization? They hold an election, and by all accounts, it was a very, it was a fair election, it was a clean election. Yeah. They won in the American way, fair and square. How do we then deny them the legitimacy of the electoral winner? Well, it's, let's say it's been awkward for us to adjust to the fact that our rhetoric uh, elevating the importance of elections uh, maybe wasn't enough, that elections aren't enough to really start on the road to the democracy, to the freedom that the administration has made its uh, its watchword in, in Middle East policy. Hasn't that been the case throughout, though, in Afghanistan and Iraq, that they've made elections equal democracy when, in fact, we know that's not the case? Well, uh, you're right. I mean, you remember the photographs of people holding up their purple right. fingers right. Uh, showing that uh, a move of great significance had been made in that the people had voted mm -hmm. and were choosing their own future. But they chose somebody in Hamas that uh, we classified as terrorist. And uh, after initially praising the election as an example of uh, popular involvement uh, in the political process, uh, we started to backpedal very quickly that, uh, hey, uh, this doesn't mean we have to finance a group that is unwilling to play the game as it's been played for the last generation. Okay, let's talk about U.S. policy. What is U.S. policy toward the Palestinian government, Hamas? Well, we have to talk about the virtual civil war in, in Palestine between uh, Fatah and uh, Hamas. Let's start with U.S. policy. Was aid cut off a mistake? I mean, there's no reconstruction, no salaries. You've got yeah. the anarchy, in fact. Is that in U.S. interest or Israeli interest for that matter? Uh, let me put it bluntly. The declared policy is to bring Hamas to accept the three principles of no violence, accept form agreements, accept Israel's right to exist. The undeclared policy is destroy Hamas. Okay. Uh, because there are those that, having looked at Hamas, think that it has uh, conducted its policy according to certain principles ever since the day it was founded back, uh, back in the 80s. And... Uh, it's not going to change. At least it's not going to change in a hurry. So the undeclared policy has put maximum pressure on Hamas by denying all foreign assistance, by making it uh, a prosecutable offense for banks in Gaza, in the West Bank, uh, to receive monies and pass them to a Hamas political figure, even if that figure may be the prime minister or mm -hmm. the minister of health, for example. What should the United States be doing, other than if it's different from what we are doing now? What should be the goal here, and how does one then take the steps to meet that goal? Well, time has passed. The election was end of January, and this hardline attitude on our part took effect starting in February. February, here we are, mid-October. Um, it hasn't worked, and the latest statements out of Hamas uh, was they were not going to change their principles. They were not going to recognize Israel. Uh, uh, so in the meantime, the scuffles, the killings, are underway in the streets of Gaza between Hamas and Fatah. The condition of the people slides down and down and down. There are no, the jobs aren't there, the salaries aren't there. Um, I think we have, to, we have to look at it again. We didn't intend to pull the plugs on the babies and the incubators in the hospital because there, there isn't enough power, et cetera, et cetera. We don't want to be seen as anti-humanitarian uh, in, in our policies, but the net result has been that. What about the Israelis? How do and how ought they respond to this situation? I mean, they responded obviously similarly to the United States, cutting off aid, withholding the taxes, yeah. etc. Is it a mistake strategically? I think it is, because I mean, but that's based on my 
some would say, soft-headed analysis that, uh, uh, you know, you've got to deal with all the forces in a society. And to blacklist that element in Palestinian political life called Hamas uh, is, is, not, is not working. I don't think it's going to work uh, because they have a dynamism. They have a respect, uh, first of all, for not being corrupt. And Fatah over the years got kind of, got kind of corrupt in its practices. So it has popular support. And there must be a way to talk to them. But for us, they are the enemy. They are the terrorists. You don't talk to your enemies. And Israel has reacted the same way. Can Israel react different? Could it react differently if, in fact, Hamas doesn't agree to the three principles? Clearly, the first principle, Israel's right to exist. Can we expect the Israelis to behave any differently in a both tactical and a strategic sense? Tactically, yes, because uh, if you get Hamas saying they look forward to a two-state solution, which is the second state, one is Palestinian, the other is Israel. But that's implicit, and that has, up to now, not been good enough for the Israeli leadership. Okay. Let's move to Lebanon. Last time we talked, a year ago, it was an encouraging time. We had the Cedar Revolution following the assassination of the former uh, prime minister, and then we have war. And it seemed that it was a miscalculation by both the Israelis and Hezbollah, by uh, Nasrallah and Olmeya. And... Were there winners? Were there losers? What, where are we in Lebanon other than in a, in a very weak state? Well, and also add to the list of those that misjudged maybe Washington itself. Washington. Israel, judging by its rhetoric at the outset of the war, its goal was to destroy Hezbollah. It, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, had started to modify that and talk of the, to degrade Hezbollah's capabilities. Well, Israel succeeded in that. Uh, there are several hundred dead Hezbollah uh, fighters. Uh, there's a lot of missiles that uh, Hezbollah used up. Uh, and it's a question, will it be possible to keep the missiles at the level they were when the war ended, when mm -hmm. the active fighting uh, stopped? But uh, it looks as if we shared, we, uh, elements, in the administration shared the conviction that Is Hezbollah could be put down and put down hard. Mm -hmm. Again, disregarding the fact that it was a popular movement among the Shia. And as we saw to, to our dismay, having initially been very pleased at the Jordanian, the Saudi, the Egyptian reaction right. saying things critical of Hezbollah for adventurism and for getting into a war which was going to cost the people uh, of Lebanon uh, sorely, without authority from the government of Lebanon. Which it did. Which it did. Uh, as that war went on, day after day after day, you saw those governments fall silent because Hezbollah became extremely popular, despite the fact of its being a Shiite movement among the broader Sunni community. An Arab has stood up to the Israelis. It was a source of pride. Uh, that they weren't, they weren't wiped out as the Arab states or governments had been wiped out militarily in a six-day war. And I think it had a profound effect on Israel and Israeli perceptions because the aura of Israeli invincibility was shattered and the, the government, even though Omet was re-elected in March, that, that government is now under severe pressure for its conduct in the war, uh, for mis not only not winning it, but miscalculation in, in, the, in the first instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does, that, does, does that produce movement or does that produce stasis? Does it make it more, more set in concrete? I think it could produce movement. It has not produced any movement that I'm aware of uh, yet. Uh, but remember, there was an earlier war, the Yom Kippur, the October War in 1973, which Sadat, working with Syria's leader, Hafez al-Assad, uh, designed as a political war in the sense, one with pretty limited ambitions. It wasn't to wipe out Israel. It was to get the Egyptian uh, forces on the east side of the Suez Canal, dislodge the uh, Israeli army from those positions, and then 
start to lay the basis for negotiations. 1973, six years passed, there was a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, and I say that peace treaty might never have happened if you hadn't had a leader who was able to enlist the, uh, uh, to lead popular opinion in his own country that, hey, we're not humiliated. And, uh, you know, we're a proud people, and, yeah, we can, we can negotiate. Do you see parallels here that sometime down the line a leader could emerge and therefore they resolve this it, more it, than half century? It, it hasn't happened yet. I don't, I don't see another Sadat on the stage. Nasrallah, the uh, cleric uh, leader uh, and political leader of Hezbollah, uh, his disadvantage, he is a Shia and uh, a contender in the political scene in Lebanon. He doesn't have the platform that the president of Egypt has always had, a broader, stronger Arab-wide mm -hmm. platform. But I don't rule it out. I, I think it's, it's very important for us not to buy into the theory, which uh, I do hear from some of the right wing in Israel, that there's only going to be peace when the Palestinians accept that they are defeated and broken and have no alternative. I don't think that's leading to peace. Are they ascendant, particularly in the aftermath of all of this? Well, I think if there were an election today, the right wing would succeed. Okay. In, in the, because they were very, very upset by certainly the... Uh, the lack of resolution in the conflict right. and you know, a lot of criticisms. It's a very free press in Israel right. and uh, the critics have been pretty savage. The current state of the Lebanese government, I mean, the, the governmental structure that the French left them in, what was it, the 1940s, where the president had to be a Maronite Christian, the prime minister a Sunni Muslim, and the head of the parliament a Shiite Muslim, almost makes it impossible for any coherent action. Uh, Hezbollah clearly in, in, in uh, military terms, superior to the Lebanese army. What happens to Lebanon and what happens to the Lebanese-Israeli situation there? Well, one plus out of the war is that the Lebanese army was finally allowed, and that had to involve Hezbollah's approval and Syria's, to move down to the border uh, with Israel, to Lebanon's southern border, Israel's northern border. That had been Hezbollah land, and uh, the Lebanese army uh, was kept out of there. Uh, one result of the war is that they are now there, and there is a stronger international force in to monitor uh, cross-border uh, incidents, and hopefully to uh, keep out the resupply of uh, missiles to Hezbollah that had been coming on a steady track from Iran through Syria to Lebanon's Certainly territory. in Israel's interest to have that occur, that this, this succeed. Yep. Looking at, and, and, and we'll, we'll, this is a topic for later discussion, Iran and the Lebanese conflict a winner? It showed in very clear terms they were a force in Lebanon to be reckoned with. They could not be just dismissed. Uh, they could they could play a role there, so as, as Syria could play a role. Iran as regional power with fairly significant geographical reach. Right, right. What about Syria? Syria's been awful quiet. Well, Syria's been, uh, I think, uh, fearing there might be a move, a military move uh, by the United States against Syria or a U.S. sanction move by Israel against mm -hmm. Syria. That mood, which was very uh, striking to anyone visiting Damascus after the assassination, and as the Syrian army was being pulled out of mm -hmm. Lebanon, that seems to have passed. They seem to be more confident today. Uh, but there's still a UN investigation underway. There was an interim report, I think, just uh, 10 days or so mm -hmm. ago made here to the Security Council. Uh, they're still looking uh, for hard facts, uh, direct connections between the assassination of the Prime Minister and uh, those responsible. They. 
I think uh, the director of the investigation said he didn't he, he didn't have those hard facts uh, as of last week. If, in fact, those hard ca facts came into view, what, what could be the, the impact of such a finding? Well, the impact could be, I mean, the setting up of an international criminal tribunal, and that, that, could, that could impact on the uh, uh, national scene in Syria if, if they were being held and charged responsible for that action. But uh, right now it seems to have had the impact uh, with the continuing investigation that while freedom of expression uh, is perhaps more than it was 20 years ago in Syria, there's been a tightening up uh, by the authorities. Whenever they get nervous, uh, controls over the writers, over the intellectuals, over their critics increase. Okay, let's move to Iraq. The last time we talked uh, in October of 2005, you speculated that with the November 2006 elections coming up and concerns by the military about strains on their capacities, that you suspected, and that was your word, that there might be some substantial troop withdrawal declaring the mission substantially accomplished. So I'm a, Why not? I'm a prophet dishonored in my own time. No, that thanks, wasn't, thanks that wasn't the point. Okay. That wasn't the point. What, what happened that, or what didn't happen? I mean, Senator Warner described last week is that we were moving sideways and that he urged a comprehensive consideration of not, you know, staying the course, whatever the course is. What is the course? Well, it seemed clear a year ago Go ahead. that the course was going to be continued stabilization thanks to our troops and our training up of the Iraqi army and police forces. Uh, coupled with the concern in our military, which is still very much alive, that concern that they are stressed out and uh, they, uh, apparently it's clearest in terms of the army reserve. They're mm -hmm. not getting the Reenlistment or the sign-up rates that they and uh, sending they sending like units back after they've, they've sending done units their back tour. on a much tighter time frame right. than than they would like to see, and a tremendous bill coming up, uh, fifty billion plus for replacing equipment worn out uh, in Iraq, and there was also hey, uh, Washington is a political place. In November elections, it would have been very nice to be able to say, look. Uh, Maybe things aren't moving as fast as uh, as we had hoped, but they're moving, and we're able to see uh, we're able to pull some troops out. That was my calculation a year ago. It didn't work. And in fact, the the national the famous national intelligence estimate that was released a couple of weeks ago that was uh, uh, done in April, and a UN report suggests that number one the, that in fact. Iraq has become a breeding ground for terrorism. In effect, the law of perverse consequences rears its ugly head, that the very condition that the, the invasion was designed to ameliorate was created, and also that deaths are up. When we last talked, we had not quite reached 2,000 American dead. We're close to 2,800 now. Why are we staying the course, and what is the course? What is the course? just isn't clear anymore. It, it seemed very clear. We were very optimistic when we went in. We had the power, we had the principles that so many countries around the world uh, must want to accept, and we presented a model which was irresistible. Well, it proved not to be the case. We have been resisted uh, in Iraq, and Iraq has become, has become a magnet for the disaffected around the Arab world to go and enlist and defend their faith, defend their identity. So Gulliver is in Lilliput and we tied our own hands, but has there been any change in, in, in U.S. policy or all I've heard is, is, is some verbal recognition that we made a couple of errors and we still have to stay the course and not cut and run. Is there any substantive change here? Well, you mentioned Senator Warner, a very powerful voice uh, on these issues, and uh, he's, that was, while mildly phrased, a, uh, 
uh, a serious warning to the administration about your drifting sideways. You have the commission, bipartisan commission, set up under former Secretary of State Baker, mm -hmm. uh, which will not release its uh, findings or its final uh, report until the point is reached that it's unanimous. The very distinguished group of Americans on that uh, commission, mm -hmm. unanimous uh, uh, consent to the recommendations. There is talk which is no longer quickly dismissed or derided as cowardly that we need to find an alternative course. Does this happen after the November election? I mean, Bush hasn't shown any inclination to change course, whatever that course is. After the November elections, depending on any number of uh, possible outcomes, is that the time to do it? I hope so. I mean, I hope it's going to happen. And the Baker Commission will give the administration uh, a good Cover, Some cover. Cover, yeah. Because uh, after a point, uh, you know, the, the idea that we could change realities in the Middle East because we wanted to change them, because we were rich and powerful and with great ideals could change them, has been shaken. That the, those assumptions just don't hold. So, in one sense, realism has overtaken ideology here? God willing. On that note, we'll end part one of City Talk in the Middle East with Richard Murphy. We will be back shortly. We will be on the air next week with part two.